Sunday school lessons this morning. Some of you looked at uh, who is Jesus. And then also how we see Jesus in us. How we see ourselves on the basis of our relationship with Jesus. We just want to continue that thought for a little bit. How does God really see us? How does God see us outwardly? How does God see us inwardly? How does God see our potential? We're going to look at uh, several different passages of Scripture. And we'll start in 1 Samuel, chapter 16. It's page 444 in your pew Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 16. You remember King Saul had been anointed as king of Israel. And then he just sort of messed up. And so God says to the prophet Samuel, Go and anoint one of the sons of David, uh, one of the sons of Jesse, as the, as the new king. And so, Samuel being the obedient prophet that he was, the obedient judge that he was, goes and says, Jesse, bring me your sons. And the first one that comes by in verse 6, came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me, but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. This guy comes in and he's tall. He's good looking. He's a fine specimen. And Samuel says, This has got to be the one. This has got to be the new king. But the Lord whispers into Samuel's heart. Wrong one. Says you're looking outwardly and not inwardly. For the, he goes on to say, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You see, God knows our hearts. God knows your heart. God knows your struggles. God knows your victories. God knows your questions. God knows your heart. God knows your strengths. God knows your weaknesses. God knows your potential. God knows your heart. Now let's go over to the New Testament and see something that Paul said in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And that would be page 1773 in your pew Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then it 
it said about the disciples that they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They didn't know a lot as far as the formal teaching that the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees had given men. And yet God saw their heart. It's amazing that God through Jesus looked at Simon and said, your name's going to be Peter or Rock. And if anybody ever seemed to be quick saying, it was Peter. I mean, you know, his foot was in his mouth more often than not. wishing, he was watching, you know, all kinds of things, but she said, you're a rock. He saw Peter's heart. He saw the things that were there. And if you flip on over a couple more pages in 1 Corinthians to chapter 6, about verse 9, it says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not appear God be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul lays there a pretty uh, complete list of, of sinful folks, sinful action. But then he goes on to say, and such were past tense, some of you, but now you're washed, you're sanctified. But you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, look, sin, a bad past, a messed up past, is no barrier to God using you. A messed up past is no barrier God using you. Many a person has listened to the devil as the devil said, well, with what you've done, you're through, you're finished, you're washed up. You're of no use to the kingdom of God. You're an embarrassment. But thank the Lord for the blood of Jesus up which washes us white as snow. Makes us pure. Makes us holy. And the Bible says when the Lord forgives us, he, our sins is removed as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers our sin against us no more. And then as that pure and that holy person, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and we are useful. And we're usable. And we are a testimony. You know, when people look at many people that they, they've seen and the change in their life, they say, oh, only God can. The grace of God and the power of God that changes lives for all of eternity. And now let's go back to the Old Testament and look at some, an interesting character in the book of Judges. If you go back to the book of Judges, chapter 6. This is one of my favorite stories. Because it shows exactly what I'm talking about as it plays out in the life of an individual. Judges chapter 6. And let's see. That's page 381 in your pew Bible. The Israelites 
or under the oppression of the Midianites. You remember the story of Gideon? And when you get to verse uh, 11, it says, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abyssalite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. In other words, the Midianites were taking every bit of food that the Israelites could produce. And so Gideon is over there in the corner, hiding, trying to thresh out some grain and keep it hidden from the enemy. And suddenly this angel appears and said unto him, verse 12, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. You're a hero. And he goes on to say in verse 14, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel, the hand of the Midianites, have I not sent thee? You're a mighty man of valor, you're a hero, and I want you to go and deliver Israel from the Midianites. Now look at Gideon's response, if you don't remember it. Verse 15, and he said, Oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You know, when the, when the angel shows up and says, Get in your mighty man of valor, get, he looks over his shoulder and looks around and says, Me? You talking to me? I mean, after all, we're from a not well known tribe. My dad's no big shot in the tribe. And I'm the run of the litter in my daddy's family. In other words, he's saying, you, 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 Angel, you got it all wrong. You should have taken a left turn instead of a right turn. You should have gone somewhere. You're talking to the wrong fellow. I am not a mighty man of valor. That's not who I am. Now, if you remember these Sunday school lessons or sermons you've heard in the past, you know that Gideon goes on to become that mighty man of honor. But I think the question that we have to ask ourselves, how did he get there? Because when we see how we get there, how he got there, we can see how we can get from where we are to where God wants us to be. See, God looks at you and he sees the potential. He says what you can do for the kingdom of God. And some of you, not me, Lord. Not me, Lord. Now, in this particular church, which is different from many churches, you can't say I don't have the education. Because almost everybody in this church seems to have a college education. You've been school teachers and principals and all these other things. And in some churches, there'd be a lot of folks that say, I don't have the education. We can't say that here. But, it's so easy to make our excuses. I still shake my head every so often about that, that I'm in the pulpit. Because I don't like to get up in front of people. I'm shy. Now, my wife and I can go off to a convention. And if I don't know anybody, I'll stand over in the corner. She'll find somebody to talk to who she's never seen before. Because that's her outgoing personality. Versus mine. Doesn't mean she's better or I'm better. It just means we're different. But just because... I don't particularly like being in the spotlight. Doesn't mean that I said, well, Lord, you can't call, you can't have couldn't have called me to preach. Because he did. And God's got a plan for your life. You may think, I can never witness to my name. And yet your unique testimony 
may be the very testimony, the very word that that particular neighbor needs to hear. God sees the potential in your life just as he saw the mighty man of valor in this scared, rapid man Gideon. So how did Gideon go from that to the mighty man of valor? Verse 19 of chapter 6. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, an unleavened case of an ephah of flour, the flesh he put in a basket, put the broth in a pot, and brought it out under him, under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon the rock, and pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose a fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now you may think, what? Gideon worshipped. In a sense, he came and he offered the sacrifice, which was the Old Testament way of worshiping. He acknowledged God. And the first step in becoming usable in the kingdom of God is for us to acknowledge He is God. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our honor. And I surrender my life to Him. And as I surrender my life to Him in worship, My heart begins to be changed from fear to strength. Notice the, the second thing he did. Chainsaws where they could go. 
Very. Maybe iron axes, but not much. They cut out those trees. They built an altar to God in the place of where the altar of Baal was. They tore down the altar of Baal first. And then they sacrificed to God. You see, we worship. We get our hearts right with God. And we deal with sin. There are people that have never gone far with the Lord, never become really useful, because sin is harboring in their hearts. The Lord says, if I want to use you, you're going to have to come to a place where you choose between this and following me. And because they refused to give up the sin. They don't accomplish much for the kingdom of God. Gideon dealt with the sin. Now, I want to ask you to turn to the uh, other scriptures because of time. But let me mention a, a couple of other things that Gideon dealt with. You remember he did the fleece? Put dew on it, and the ground dry, and then the ground wet, and the fleece dry. And people try to do that today, but you don't need to do that. Be careful about fleeces today. You, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. He will guide you. He will direct your heart. If the Holy Spirit says, do it, do it. If the Holy Spirit says, don't do it, don't do it. And sometimes we get out there and we start putting the police, you know. This is a terrible illustration, but I'm, I remember it because I heard another preacher tell it. You know, man and woman not married each other, they go to a motel room and they say, okay, nobody knocks on the door in 15 minutes. No, you know what came next. Don't nobody knock on the door. Holy Spirit was telling them, no, 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 no. But they put out a fleece that was stupid. Listen to the Spirit of God. And He will direct your path. He will show you what's right. He will show you what's wrong. He will show you what direction to take. And Gideon continued to follow even when others were fearful. You remember he gathered an army of about um, what, 30,000, 33,000 or so. And, uh, the Midianites only had 110,000 men. So he's already out of number about three, four to one. I mean, four or five to one. And God says, hey, you got too many. Get it. Everybody's scared to go home. And about 20,000 of them left. And get in and quit. And then God says, You still have too many. And He takes them down to the water and watches them drink. And all the ones that were unprepared and careless, He sent them home until He had 300. And you see, sometimes when you're following the Lord, you have to keep following, even if others around you are afraid. You have to keep following when others around you are unprepared. But when you follow the Lord, there's victory. And with that 300, Gideon defeated an army of 110,000. Why? He got his heart right. He dealt with sin. He was obedient to the Lord. And what others around him were doing <coughs> did not sway him from obedience. How often this plays out in the Christian life. You think about even in the Old Testament. 
Joshua and Caleb saying, hey, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. The other ten said, no, 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 no. Those giants will eat us alive. But who entered the promised land? Joshua and Caleb. You think about David. Here's this big old, about 10 feet tall giant. Everybody else said, oh man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? David said, hey, that uncircumcised Philistine's nothing in the hands of God. Why? You see, God looks at your heart. When he sees a mighty man or a mighty woman of God, he sees what you can be and what you can accomplish for his glory. And when he sees you and he speaks to you and he calls you, worship. Make a commitment that's continual. Deal with any hindering sin. And then keep following the Lord. No matter if others fall away. Keep following the Lord. Jesus says when you put your hand in the plow, don't look back. I, I can believe that there's some people here this morning that have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In a moment when we sing the invitation to him, would you walk this aisle and say, today I give my heart to Jesus. Today I give my heart to Jesus. Starting this day, I want to serve him for the rest of my life. And whether you walk the aisle or whether you're right where you are, look into your heart. What mighty man of valor or woman of valor activities does God want from you? Are you willing to not make excuses and just simply say, I worship you, Lord. Lord, forgive me for the sin that's kept me from falling home. Lord, forgive me for being distracted by those around me who, who aren't encouraging. And from this moment on, I want to serve you, Lord. I want to see what great things you do that brings glory to you. Not because I'm tall and handsome and good-looking or whatever, like Eliab, but because I am surrendered to you. Would you make that commitment with me this morning? Whether you walk the aisle or whether you do it right where you are. Say, yes, Lord. I want to be a part of the army of God that brings in the kingdom and the return of Jesus.